prior to the rise in sea levels that transformed Port Phillip Bay into what we now know as the expansive surface of marine waters, the area was a different landscape. During the last glacial period when global temperatures were much cooler and enormous quantities of water were locked up in giant ice sheets, sea levels were lower. And what is now the floor of the bay was dry and landlocked. That means it probably looked much like a plain, with a unique biodiversity, but one that was by no means static. We will look into the indigenous stories of what this area once looked like to paint a rich picture of it prior to the rise in sea levels and the inundation that followed. We will also look at a period when Port Phillip Bay became dammed some 8,000 years ago, leading to the bay drying up for a period of time, before ultimately succumbing to the sea and refilling. This episode of refilling has two estimated dates. One is 6,000 years ago, based on stories told by indigenous inhabitants, and the other is 1,000 years ago, based on scientific research. I'm not sure which is true, but what is true is that this area definitely dammed up. Some 20,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum, the area that is now Port Phillip Bay was an extensive river plain. What is now an expanse of open water would have then been a river system, fed by what is now the Yarra and Werribee River. The river plain had an extraordinary diverse array of habitats. Open grasslands within forests, wetlands, clear water streams and much more. The land was densely forested, particularly near the widespreading rivers and the vegetation supported many species of animals and plants. If we look on magnetics, we can actually see some signs of the original rivers that flow through here, as a result of recent volcanic eruptions occurring which flowed into the rivers, allowing us to see it on magnetics. It's clear that several volcanoes exist in the bay, some of which are quite large. It's fascinating to think that indigenous inhabitants once gazed and probably walked upon these now fully submerged volcanic structures. The flora of the region would have been dominated by temperate plants suited to the well-drained soils of the river valley. Eucalypt forests and woodlands would have grown on higher ground, while areas closer to the river would have been rich in lush riparian vegetation of waterside reeds, sedges and other plants tolerant of moisture. This diverse mosaic of habitats would have supported a range of megafauna, including the Thyprotodon, an enormous wombat-like marsupial, as well as the marsupial lion. Smaller mammals, birds, reptiles and amphibians would have been abundant. As previously mentioned, at the same time humans lived in this region, walking on land that their ancestors had occupied for generations. Indigenous inhabitants of the floodplain, which centuries later would be called the Yarra River Valley, are thought to have been the ancestors of the Watharong, Woiwarung, and Boonwarung peoples. I hope I'm saying these names right, my apologies if I'm not. These early human inhabitants were successful hunter-gatherers who adapted to their environments. They hunted upriver and elsewhere in the forested landscape, gathered plant foods and used riverine systems as fishing grounds. Evidence of human occupation was preserved for tens of thousands of years across the region, with stone tools and other items emerging from the landscape. Port Phillip's current day cliffs, serpentine waterways and grassy plains have all been shaped by dynamic interactions between these constituent parts of the planet. There are generation old stories from local indigenous inhabitants of how their landscape was wiped clean of human presence by roiling waters when sea levels first rose, some 8,000 years ago and how they coped with changing landscapes and waterscapes. Before the bay filled, it was well stocked with kangaroo and emu, and was exploited intensively by the native tribes for hunting and gathering. Thousands of people and many times that number of animals populated the riverside. Stories from local indigenous inhabitants describe the history of this time, recording a period when the bay was a connected landmass, rich in vegetation and game. We caught plenty of kangaroo and possums, they say, Stories that are thought to date back between 7,800 and 9,350 years ago, some of which predate sea level rise. The Great Flood, a defining event for those oral traditions, turning the dry plain into the vast bay that we see today was reputedly not very long ago. The story's details were passed down orally by the Boonwurrung and Warringeri, two groups from Australia's Kulin Nation. The story, roughly as follows, describes a Great Flood that covered the country very quickly. The water came into the low places and covered the country all the way to the mountains. The mountains were higher than the water, but grew lower day by day. Then what covered the country became a bay. When the earth started warming worldwide around 12,000 years ago, temperatures soared enough for the glaciers to begin to melt. Their ice masses started to diminish, causing the sea level to rise incrementally, 
It would take millennia for the water to swamp the river valley. Slowly, the rising waters would drown the valley lowlands, transforming the landscape. The first affected areas flooded, making the sea level rise by pooling up into lakes and swampland. By roughly 8,000 years ago, the seas were rising high enough that they began to fill the river valley more consistently, with a proto-bay forming. But it didn't happen all at once. Sandbars and natural barriers periodically prevented the influx of seawater, isolating bodies of water in marshy environments. In the wake of the flooding, the new bay presented a wholly new set of problems and opportunities. The fertile hunting grounds had become an aquatic environment. Tribes adopted fishing and coastal foods to meet their subsistence needs and began to tell traditions that reflected the new landscape. Research led by Dr Guy Holdgate from Melbourne University in 2011 indicated that the bay's entrance was blocked by a sand and silt buildup, estimated to have occurred 8,000 years ago, which cut it off from the Bass Strait. This blockage resulted in the bay being mostly dry except for a small salty lake in the middle. Indeed, several clear-cut Western scientific studies have verified the wisdom of these oral histories, showing how the sandbar at the entrance of the bay broke through about 1,000 years ago, rapidly filling up like the indigenous stories tell. This breach was presumably the result of natural processes, storms, erosion, and maybe an earthquake. The flooding of Port Phillip Bay when the blockage was breached would likely have been a dramatic and relatively rapid event. The water from the ocean would have flowed into the bay with considerable force. The difference in water levels between the ocean and the bay would have created a strong pressure gradient, driving the water rapidly through the breached barrier. The new sea put its waters very quickly to the ends in which they now come. Given the bay's topography, this would mean that the lowest points would flood first with water spreading outwards and upwards to fill the entire basin. Port Phillip Bay has a relatively shallow depth compared to other bays and harbours around the world. But with that being said, if you were standing at the lowest point of the bay prior to it being inundated with water, the areas all around, including the Melbourne CBD, would appear to look like mountains from that low point. Which fascinates me. To put this in perspective, imagine standing in a location that is 24 metres below sea level, which is the deepest point of the bay, and Melbourne CBD would be at an elevation of 31 metres above sea level. The total elevation difference would be 55 metres, making the CBD appear as a considerable height from the deepest point of the bay. This elevation difference would indeed give the impression of Melbourne CBD and its surrounding areas as elevated landforms, similar to how hills or small mountains might appear when viewed from a low point. For much of this transitional time, the Port Phillip Bay landscape was an intricate mixture of aquatic and terrestrial environments. There was an extensive system of freshwater lakes, marshes and wetlands in the river valley, making for an overall highly diverse assemblage of habitats. This was an area with extraordinarily high biodiversity. Bird life was especially prolific, and the surrounding waters served as a dreamscape, supplying a substantial harvest for the original inhabitants. This also meant, over the course of many thousands of years, that the ecosystems of the river valley had to change, as both plants and animals were able to migrate higher. The humans who lived in the foothills would undoubtedly have adapted their lifestyle in some way over time, adapting their hunting and gathering to the changing resources of a landscape becoming ever more submerged. Prior to sea level rise, Port Phillip Bay was a dynamic river valley shaped over millennia into one of the most significant river valleys in Australia. Animals, plants, megafauna and some of the earliest human inhabitants lived in this landscape before sea levels slowly crept north and increased. Meltwater from the end of the Ice Age glaciers inundated the river valley first as a series of freshwater wetlands, then constantly saline or brackish marshes, before gradually becoming the marine bay that it is today. I hope you enjoyed this look back into the formation of Port Phillip Bay as much as I did, and as always, thanks for watching. Are you interested in animals? I've just started a second channel called Paleozoology that discusses extinct and extant animals with a current focus on the megafauna that once dominated and roamed Australia. I've released a video on the marsupial lion which existed in Australia during the time Indigenous Australians walked the continent. I've also covered the wombat that was the size of a car, known as the Diprotodon, or the largest terrestrial lizard known as the Megalania. I'd love to have you along for the journey as more videos are released. You can find a link to this channel and to the aforementioned videos in the description and in the pinned comment in the comment section. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.